So what is Fourier series? So first let us learn something about the Fourier series. This is a very general expression which we have written here for Fourier series. It can be f of x equals a naught plus a 1 cosine 2 pi x a 2 cosine 2 pi 2 x. So we are now writing the cosine part of the f of x and then we write the sine part of the f of x with coefficients b 1, b 2, b 3 and b n. So a 1, a 2, a 3 are the ones which are associated with the cosine, the real part of the function and the b1, b2, b3 are the ones which are associated with the sine of the function and you see that sine 2 pi x, sine 2 pi 2 x, sine 2 pi 3, 3 x and so on, sine 2 pi n x. It essentially represents a periodic function. So this overall is a periodic function. One is a periodicity associated with cosine, the other with the sine. Both of the cosine and the sine functions are anyway we know are periodic functions and therefore effectively what it represents is a function like this. You see the resemblance of this with our structure factor expression in terms of the cosine and the sine being present. The only thing which is not present in this is the i, the absolute, uh, the, um, the uh, imaginary component associated with that. But then we can also have the imaginary component brought in here with by expressing this in terms of an exponential. So basically the Fourier series represents a periodic function. So if a function f which is a variable x associated with it and that value of x comes in these positions associated with the cosine function as well as the sine function. And this uh, periodicity is expressed in this particular form. So now let us uh, go over to uh, a situation where we have uh, h in this particular case is an integer, a and b are constants and x is a fraction of a period. So this is the periodicity, x is the fraction of the period. So when we have a situation like this, it is better we understand it a little better in terms of uh, actually considering a function which is uh, periodic. So what we do is we consider a periodic step function as is shown here. This is from the textbook of Stout and Jensen. Of course uh, what I will do is that towards the end of the course I will give acknowledgments to all the uh, textbooks from which I have taken the pictures. I will also give references to all those textbooks and at the same time acknowledge the individual authors because but for them this course could, have, could not have been compiled. So we will come to that to when we come to the end of the course. So this is a periodic function. The periodic function is a four term cosine approximation of a periodic. So we are dropping out the sine part, we are looking only at the cosine part and this is the expression y equals pi by 4. Pi by 4 now defines the extent to which this step function goes. So this is a step function. So we step up here by pi 1 fourth, keep it steady, come down, then this is 0 for some time and then again 1 fourth and again 0 for some time and it repeats periodically. So the periodicity is in terms of this to this distance. It could be any point here and any point here is a periodicity. Uh, one has a pi by 4 step associated with it. So this step function can get a mathematical form pi by 4 plus cosine 2 pi x minus 1 third cosine 2 pi 3 x plus 1 fifth cosine 2 pi 5 x. Of course we can add many, many, many more terms. We are now making an approximation by using a four term cosine function to fit this so called step function. So we have a step function already given to us and we want to fit the uh, coefficients in such a way and organize the expression in such a way that we fit it to the step function. So let us take the first part which is the pi by 4. So if we take the pi by 4 this is represented in the uh, diagram B here uh, which will tell us that this is at a height of y equals uh, pi by 4. So this we call it as the first component y1 which represents the period of the step which is repeated here, the, uh, the, uh, the amplitude of the step which is repeated here. 
uh, the uh, step size in other words is one fourth and this is shown as uh, this is pi 4 pi by 4 and that is shown in this first plot. The second plot takes the plots the second function which is cosine 2 pi x. Now what we will do is we plot the cosine 2 pi x uh, y 2 is cosine 2 pi x and that cosine 2 pi x follows this path. And similarly the minus one third cosine 3 2 pi times x is a plot which is shown here. And the fourth function which is one fifth cosine 2 pi 5 x has a function which is behaves like this in this particular plot. So, these are actual plots of individual components of these uh, four term case. So, this is term 1, this is term 2, this is term 3 and this is term 4. So, now we will represent a overall y where we sum up all these four as is shown here. So, when we take the sum of all these four expressions, we will get a function which is shown here uh, on top of the existing step function. So, our idea is to fit this step function by uh, an equation, right? And we have taken four uh, terms here, and these four terms almost nearly fit it by this variation. So, this variation is, uh, is showing the deviation of the fit with respect to the actual existing one. So, suppose this you consider as your f ops, okay, uh, this will be your f calculated and you see that there is an approximation associated with it. Now, as we keep adding the functions, we can add now the function 1 7th minus 1 7th cosine 2 pi 7 x and then we can add the next function which is plus 1 9th cosine 2 pi 9 x and so on. So, we keep on adding it take to infinite series then eventually what it represents is this function, this step function. So, the four term approximation is bringing essentially the, uh, the near complete uh, representation of the periodic function. You see the periodicity in the repeat of the four functions uh, up there in pi, four, pi by 4 region and down below in the pi by 4 region. So, even though for example, if you had this at y 1 4th throughout, you see that the big dip in this function, the dips associated with these functions will take it at the 0 level. So, y 1 4th gets cancelled and therefore, you see that one can take uh, additional uh, terms, we can have 10 terms, the larger the number of terms, okay, the better is the fit and that is how uh, we can now uh, look at the Fourier series. So, in the case uh, of the resemblance of this Fourier series to what we are doing here, the Fourier transforms, you see that we have a large number of observations, J, it is a large number, this is over all the atoms, but the observations we have are in terms of uh, the H, K and L and we have a large number of H, K, L measurements from our reciprocal lattice availability. So, from the reciprocal lattice we have measured a very large number of H, K, L. What we have to fit of course is are the values of x j, y j, z j which are associated with the, with the atomic scattering factor f j. Uh, but if you look at the expression below, you see that this is now the Fourier transform of the top expression and the Fourier transform of the top expression now gives us the electron density. So, if you now consider this part, this now should in principle represent the electron density associated with the system. And this now is replaceable, this part is replaceable by this quantity which is practical. So, we write rho of x, y, z as equal to 1 over v because we are now looking at a volume of the unit cell. See this again brings us back to the symmetry and structural details we have. Because of the periodicity, we do not have to sum it over the entire crystal. The crystal can consist of a large number of unit cells, thousands of unit cells the summation can be the calculation can be restricted to the volume. So, whatever we get in the volume will repeat in the next unit cell volume and so on. So, we can calculate only for that. So, therefore, this expression rho of x y z will get this 1 divided by v as we see in both these cases. The presence of 1 divided by v essentially tells us that we are now in a defined, defined single crystal and we have the unit cell that is defined. And so, we then uh, do it over for some over all the HKL values. You see, you have thousands of measurements. So, every measured f of HKL modulus you have calculated, you have put it on an absolute scale by the Wilson plot and then this exponential i phi HKL will give us the phases. 
how do we get to these values is the next step which we will consider times exponential 2 pi i h x plus k y plus l z which is a representation of the atom position x y z. So, with respect to all the atoms we have this general expression for rho of x y z which depends upon the summation over all h k and l. In principle if we want a perfect fit to this uh, uh, y one fourth curve it should be an integral value of all these terms. In other words we should have replaced this by a triple integral integration going over h k and l minus infinity to plus infinity in principle. But in a crystal we have the advantage of uh, limiting the number of h values uh, to a certain values k to a certain value and l to a certain value. So, it is now a effectively a triple summation uh, replacing the triple integral integration over h, integration over k, integration over l is replaced by summation over h, summation over k, summation over l. So, this is a three dimensional summation which now takes the f h k l value, it also takes the phase into account and therefore, the electron density can be computed. This represents now a complete representation or near complete representation of the periodic function. So, let me repeat this issue a little bit. What is happened here is that we have now a function and that function is now chosen in such a way that it will mimic the actual electron density distribution inside the crystal. If we want to mimic that one we have to now have it in terms of what we call as the Fourier series and this Fourier series expansion we have discussed in terms of an expression which is a four term expression here we see that it is almost there. If you add four more terms it will become better and better. So, as we keep adding terms it will become better and better. So, the rho of x y z as we keep adding over all possible h k l's this will give the best possible uh, identification of the electron density. So, that is the logic with which we build up the Fourier series. Now, we will uh, see how to solve the structure you see the we have in order to solve the structure let me go back to the previous slide in order to solve the structure we need this fellow and this is the phase factor. As we have been telling over and over again this phase problem is a serious problem. In fact, it is so serious that there is no solution to this problem. We can only get approximate values of the phases. We cannot get the actual values of the phases. So, we can only make an approximation closest to the right phases and from there on go and try to improve the structure. So, that is why we get a trial structure and the trial structure is taken to the full better refined structure based on the fact that we have over determined uh, data set. So, the determination of the phase therefore, becomes very crucial in order to that is the major step for towards structure determination. So, when once we have this we can then use this expression to calculate uh, the electron density distribution which will tell us where the positions of the atoms inside the unit cell. So, the summation is over the unit cell and within the unit cell we will get the information of where the atoms are sitting and since f of h k l depends upon f j the, uh, uh, the nature of the atom will also be shown when once we compute this quantity. So, we will know whether it is a carbon, nitrogen, oxygen depending upon the value that we can associate with f of j. So, if this is the procedure we have to now think of the methodology by means of which we can solve the phase associated with this. So, the so called solution to the phase problem. One of the solutions to the phase problem was arrived at by a person called Patterson. Uh, of course, I have written it here that he worked in uh, uh, Eugen Warren's, uh, Warren's lab at MIT. In 1935, he developed this um, expression. This expression you see has lot of similarities to the previous expressions except that we are now using modulus of f of h k l square. When we use modulus of f of h k l square after the Wilson plot we are using absolute values of the intensities. So, f of h k l square represents is proportional to the intensity with all the constants and things like that. So, we have therefore, a, a f of h k l square as the component here times cosine 2 pi h u plus k v plus l w where u, v and w represent the interatomic vectors. What do we mean by interatomic vectors? These are vectors which are between atoms. So, for example, u is suppose there are two atoms in the structure, uh, u is equal to x 1 
minus x2, the x coordinate difference. Similarly, we can get uh, v equals y1 minus y2, w equals z1 minus z2. So, this is the distance between the two atoms and that comes in as the interatomic vector and that is the factor which comes here. Otherwise, you see the similarity between the expression we had for the structure factor and the electron density. Here instead of the electron density, we have the so called Patterson function. P u v w therefore represents the Patterson function and since these are vectors, this represents a vector space. So, these are this now defines a vector space. We have the direct space, we have the reciprocal space and now we also have the vector space. So, Patterson represents the vector space. What you see here is the total absence of the phase. So, we do not have the phase information that is required here. It is become everything is real. We will see the properties of Patterson in a few minutes. But here the quantities are only real quantities because we are using cosine function and there is no I sine component which is associated with it. And as a consequence, this can be directly evaluated in real space. So, it is a vector space and vector space now represents the real space vector space. And so, the way in which we go about using this Patterson function is something which we will describe in the near in the next few slides. Even though Patterson function looked as though it can solve any structure, in fact, it, in principle it can. However, when once we have this uh, Patterson expression, it becomes extremely difficult to uh, evaluate individual atom positions from the collection of all these interatomic vectors because Patterson is by itself a centrosymmetric uh, system and it represents a centrosymmetric uh, map and therefore, this vector map is centrosymmetric. That means, u can be x1 minus x2, it can also be x2 minus x1. Both are one and the same and they are expressed with respect to a common origin. So, uh, as a consequence, there will be a large number of overlapping vectors. So, the, as the crystal size increases, one or two atoms, two or three atoms is no problem. But as the size of the, uh, the molecule increase, suppose we have 20 atom, 30 atom, 40 atom structures, the number of vectors will enormously increase. We will see how it all happens in the coming slides. But one thumb rule which I will mention at the very beginning is that when you want to determine the structure using the Patterson function, it is generally recommended particularly for small molecule structures for a successful structure determination, you should look at this ratio. The ratio of the number of heavy atoms, the square of the z value of the number of heavy atoms, sum over all the possible heavy atoms. Suppose there is only one heavy atom, then it is depends upon the z square of the heavy atom, z being the atomic number. So, if we have uh, carbon, it is 6 square, it is not a very heavy atom. Uh, on the other hand, if we have bromine, we have 35.5 square, which will be a very heavy atom. So, compare it to the weight associated with it the weight associated with bromine is much, much more than the weight that is associated with carbon. So, it is generally recommended that when we want to use uh, Patterson function and do not go to any other phase determination protocol, the approach of Patterson is preferred whenever you have this ratio satisfied, at least nearly equal to 1. It is not a, not a necessary uh, requirement. That is why I say it is a convenient thumb rule. But whenever we are close to this ratio with all the remaining atoms in the structure represented by this denominator, then it is not a serious problem to use the Patterson function. So, Patterson function will give us now the heavy atom positions uniquely and fairly accurately because this uh, information in the Patterson is after all a development of the presence is due to the development of the presence of atoms inside the unit cell and that is what we are looking for. So, it does give us the positions of the atoms, particularly the heavy atoms. And when once we have the, the, the data which is now giving us the heavy atoms, we can use the overdetermined data set to determine the remaining light atoms by, the, by a procedure which we described just now, the using the Fourier synthesis. So, uh, the, this is just a convenient thumb rule. Now, let us look at the other properties of the Patterson function. So, as I mentioned, there is a vector between every pair of atoms in the structure and this includes the self vectors that is 
x1 on uh, the uh, x1 y1 z1 on x1 y1 z1 itself which will generate the origin peak. So, um, for n atoms if there are n atoms in the unit cell 20 atoms in the unit cell we get 20 square minus n minus 20 peaks. So, all these peaks now originate from the single origin and therefore, there is a severe overlap of these vectors. So, every pair of atoms uh, uh, to uh, forms 5 2 vectors a to b and b to a which are equal and opposite. Therefore, uh, Patterson has inversion symmetry. So, Patterson is always central symmetric. What is also important is the fact that uh, all the phases we can set them to 0 automatically forces inversion center. So, that means, uh, Patterson does not worry about the phase factor. What is important in a Patterson is therefore, we all the space groups which we have discussed now. Now, we will bring in back bring back the symmetry. See the, the discussion in this course is on symmetry rather than anything else symmetry and structure in the solid state. So, we are looking at crystals and in the crystals we can now do the Patterson synthesis by calculating the Patterson map which is a vector map. But this particular Patterson map is always center symmetric whether the crystal is center symmetric or non centric the Patterson map is always center symmetric that is one problem one, one issue. The second issue is that all translation involved components of our symmetry like 2 1 screw axis the glide planes they will lose their translation component when we do the Patterson synthesis. So, if it is a p 2 1 upon c the Patterson symmetry is 2 by m. Uh, so, this is already indicated uh, in the uh, international tables. Uh, of crystallography and when we go back to the previous two classes and look at those slides which we have on the space group representation, we also indicate the Patterson symmetry. So, the Patterson symmetry for P 2 1 by C will be P 2 by M. So, the Patterson will have only P 2 by M. On the other hand, if you have a C centered lattice, let us say C 2 by C, uh, then the Patterson will be C 2 by M it will lose the translation component associated with the screw axis and the glide planes, but the lattice information is preserved. So, the number of possible symmetries that Patterson represents can easily be calculated and I wish I want you to calculate that. I will not tell you how many possible Patterson space groups are possible in, in principle I want you to find out. So, what is happening is that the, the primitive lattices remain primitive the centered lattices remains centered that means, the C lattice remains C lattice F remains F I remains I and so on. And all the translation components like in a structure of P 2 1 2 1 2 1 uh, the Patterson symmetry becomes P 2 by M 2 by M 2 by M which is P M M M. So, the uh, symmetry reduces uh, the, the neglects the translation components associated with the uh, operations like screw axis and glide planes. However, it retains the centering information, the lattice information is retained. So, this is something which one should remember that is what is written in this paragraph. So, whatever I described just now is uh, written up here. So, the Lave class, the Patterson synthesis is the same as the Lave class for the diffraction pattern. However, the space group retains the lattice type. Now, each peak resulting from a vector between two atoms has a size which is proportional to the atomic number. Uh, that means to say that that means to say that if we have let us say a z i and z j, then uh, the two atoms, uh, the product of the atomic numbers, will be now proportional to the height, peak height, or the peak value. So if there are two carbon atoms the Patterson peak will be proportional to 36, 6 and 6. If there are there is a bromine atom, it will be proportional to 35.5 and we are now considering the vector between uh, the carbon atom and the bromine atom. This will be 35.5 times 6. So, you see that the peaks that appear in the Patterson function are very sensitive to the z value. And therefore, if we have heavy atoms that is the logic of using that z heavy square divided by z square as a thumb rule because it is possible now when we compute the Patterson map the peaks associated with the heavy atoms will stand out. 
particularly if we are if both z and z j now we are looking at the bromine to bromine vector it will be not only be longer as far as the bond distance is concerned because between bromine and bromine it will be very long distance compared to the distance between copper and carbon which is a covalent distance of 1.54 bromine and bromine may not have a covalent distance c to br will have which is longer than c to c but bromine to bromine distance will be more than 3 3 and a half angstroms so this vector therefore will not only appear at 3 and a half angstroms from the origin it will also come with a z i z j proportional to 35.5 square which is a very large value and so it is therefore possible to use the patterson uh, synthesis to identify the vectors that occur between bromine and bromine the vector that occur between carbon and bromine and so on so one once we identify those vectors in principle we can find out where these atoms are so this is known as the heavy atom approach and patterson synthesis is basically used when we have a heavy atom along with a large number of small atoms so the position of the heavy atom can be determined and when once we determine the position of the heavy atom we can put the heavy atom into the expression for f calculated and therefore the phase that is associated with the bromine atom the heavy atom is now considered to be the phase associated with the rest of the structure even it is it is an approximation but you see the phase modification will be maximum in case of a heavy atom than compared to the lighter atoms and so it will be a dominant factor so when once we use that information and then go and do the f0 minus fc the delta f synthesis or the difference fourier synthesis then we will get the rest of the structure so heavy atom position first determined and using the heavy atom determined position we compute the f calc and then do a difference fourier between f0 minus f calc the heavy atom position disappears the rest of the atoms one now will show up okay so if you have for example looking for a uh, a particular person who is thin among a large number of a, a few heavy people you remove the heavy person then you can identify the thin person so just get rid of the heavy person and then you get the thin person so that is the idea of locating the rest of the atoms and when we locate all these atoms uh, in principle we will get to the structure determination so if the unit cell contains a relatively small number that's what i have written here uh, among a majority of lighter ions the peaks corresponding to the vectors between pairs of these heavy atoms remember we don't get the position of the heavy atom we get the vector distance between the atoms will be large and will stand out clearly from general unresolved background level of the smaller peaks so it is possible therefore to use the patterson synthesis in case you have a heavy atom and in case the heavy atom is following our thumb rule the presence of the heavy atom in the structure follows the some thumb rule it can be more than one heavy atom it is not necessary just to have one heavy atom but this ratio should be reasonably satisfied however very very many complex structures have been determined by patterson synthesis because the development of the next method which we are going to discuss later uh in the class is the so called direct methods by definition itself direct methods mean that we directly determine the phases so until the development of that took place and it matured into a very useful and straight forward computable methodology uh patterson was the only preferred method so the preferred patterson method therefore is the one which in fact sort of uh, took care of everything so the preferred patterson uh, method was uh, determining many many structures so in initial days what people did particularly the organic chemists did was to uh, have a heavy atom derivative of that compound which they want to get the structure of so suppose they make a structure and they want to determine the structure and there is no heavy atom what they do is uh, for suppose there is a phenyl ring and a nitro group attached to it to the nitro group they will attach a bromine atom so that the structure of the, the molecule can be determined very little did they realize at that particular time that the two compounds will be very different in their properties if one is looking for a property the heavy atom uh, the substitution is not a very good idea because it's changing the nature of the compound but you will get the structure all right so initial days of structure determination if you look at literature people put heavy atom derivatives and determine the heavy atom position and thereby solve the structure and then they assume that 
without the heavy atom also the structure may be very nearly the same. So, many of the early day structures therefore use the Patterson methodology to determine the structure of heavy atom derivatives of organic compounds that is there plenty in literature. But then when once they realize that the property which you are looking for is completely disappearing there is no point in uh, introducing a heavy atom derivative they had to live with light atoms. By that time the direct methods evolved and direct methods evolved into such a situation that it could be easily programmed in. So, the development of uh, high speed computers and modern technology for data collection enabled the uh, takeover of structure determination uh, procedure by the direct methods over and over the Patterson function. So, the Patterson methods are still used in various circumstances. In fact, they are very much useful in determining the structure of proteins as we will discuss later on very briefly because we are now coming towards the end of the course. So, we cannot now go into the detail of that. However, we will discuss it briefly. Other than that direct methods is the most preferred one because it is easy to program and what all you have to do now in the modern day structure determination protocol is to press an enter button after getting the structures after getting the observed structure factors on an absolute scale and the rest of it is done by the machine using the direct methods. So, uh, continuing with the Patterson uh, we see that uh, very complicated structures of course were determined. In fact, the structure of vitamin B12 uh, which got the Nobel Prize uh, to Dorothy Hodgkins was solved uh, by, the, uh, by the location of the cobalt atom. You see that my thumb rule will not be valid here anymore because there are so many other atoms. But still the structure could be done by identifying the cobalt position. In fact, this structure was done by uh, a group of people uh, who were working under Dorothy Hopkins and I take pride in announcing that one of them happened to be an Indian and that Indian happens to be Professor Venkateshan with whom I did my PhD. So, there is a connection. So, this is one of the very difficult structures which were done in those days and the uh, admittedly with lot of difficulty you know it was not a straightforward uh, uh, structure solution and the phases from the cobalt atom were used is the z square ratio I have given here just for your um, wonder this z square ratio was 0.17 we said it should be nearly 1. But if you take the z square ratio here it is 0.17 and that shows the effort put by that group in order to determine the structure of vitamin B12. But no matter what this was a very crucial structure determined in those days one of the biggest structures of those days which got the Nobel Prize to Dorothy Hopkins who did wonderful things later on, uh, but then this is where uh, things worked out the way. There is one uh, little issue with Patterson and that issue is where is the symmetry? We have been talking about symmetry and structure in uh, three dimensions and four and then we are looking at projections, we are looking at possibilities of uh, translational periodicities getting involved and so on. But what we said was that in Patterson the symmetry associated with two the two one screw axis becomes two fold the glide planes become a mirror. So, where did the where did the information of symmetry which we have in all these the crystal systems go away? It did not go away. Uh, it, it stayed in the Patterson and that is known as a Harker line and planes. So, the information that is contained in Harker lines and planes will tell us the space group information whether they have the translation components associated with the uh, space group which we have. So, even though the Patterson now has reduced the symmetry the information regarding the translation involved components which are present with that particular space group is incorporated into what we call as Harker lines and planes. So, Harker of course also should have walked away with a Nobel Prize. He did so many other things. In fact, he is the one who actually initiated work in the direct methods. The so called Harker Casper inequalities actually heralded the, uh, the uh, protocol which was eventually uh, which eventually became direct methods. Uh, that is something which is remarkable. Harker also contributed to so many other things. And, uh, uh, the one of the things which uh, Harker contributed was the structure determination of proteins. So, I think we will discuss these issues with the Harker lines planes and 
contribution of Harker because it so happens that I overlapped with Harker when I was a postdoc in uh, SUNY Buffalo and he unless I talk about him no course on symmetry and structure is complete because the fact that Patterson dis took away the information on the symmetry. However, the fact that it retained the symmetry was discovered by Harker and that helped in solving many, many structures. Suppose a heavy atom derivative gets into a P21221 structure and then the 21221 information disappeared in the Patterson. You determine the position of the heavy atom all right, but how do you determine the rest of the atoms? Now, where is that information that is associated with the heavy atom position? In fact, the heavy atom position, the location of the heavy atom position is contained in the so-called Harker lines and planes. In fact, we use these to determine the structure and that is why uh, this contribution from Harker is enormously significant. So, we can say that you know there are so many people who are listed under those who did not get the Nobel Prize. So, Harker is one such.